Okay, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the Bogoban uh, coaching program. Uh, I think from now on, I'm actually gonna call it the Bogoban board because it will actually refer to the idea of the Bogoban board, which I feel, I feel like it more appropriately reflects of what the Bogoban coaching program represents. It represents the board. The, this program cannot be done without the board. So we're gonna, I'm gonna refer to it as a Bogoban board coaching program or just the Bogoban coaching program. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm gonna give you a very quick overview of the Metamodern modern quadrants. The Metamodern modern quadrants is one of the basic um, integrative uh, interactive way uh, uh, it's not more interactive, it's more like a mental logistic way of understanding how the Bogoban coaching program works, okay? There are the video, uh, I posted the video in open, it's on my YouTube channel, it's uh, those of you in my Bogoban uh, coaching program, uh, the closed uh, group, you have the video, uh, please make sure you guys watch it, please make sure um, you understand more or less what I am talking about. If you don't understand, please make sure to ask me questions because understanding the way uh, metamodern quadrants work is the way to understand how Bogoban works and the way to kind of comprehend and the way to use the Bogoban tool within your either personal or professional practice, okay? Bogoban is an amazing coaching tool that can be used for both. I use it a lot for personal use. I use it a lot for professional use. So it's extremely versatile. It's very quick. I like to call it very quick, very simple way of figuring out what is it that you want to do? Where do you want to be? What is your goal? That's why we call it a coaching tool because it focuses on your goal and how to bring your goal into the realization, okay? Um. Let's do this. Let me go over the metamodern squares uh, idea very quickly. Let me turn on the slideshow. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Metamodern quadrants. Okay, we're going to go quickly. I may go over some slides quicker than the other ones because in this specific session, I have a goal. My goal is to quickly take you to the metamodern quadrants so that we can focus on the practice of the Bogoban board. I wanna show you, I wanna, I wanna actually, uh, uh, if you didn't print out yet those uh, colored pages, you by the way, don't have to print out all the color pages if you don't have a choice to do that. Now you can print out one, just focus whatever color you want to print out, go according to your intuition. If you have all of them, that's wonderful, okay? So the Bogoban, uh, one of the major influencers within the metamodern quadrants and the Bogoban uh, coaching program are the following people. Kurt, Kurt Lewin. Kurt Lewin is a German-American psychologist. He, the major implication of his research idea, right? He was uh, uh, one of the pioneers, social organization on applied psychology. Of course, he lived in... Uh, again, he was he was born in Germany uh, when the Nazis came to power, like many other uh, psychologists. I believe he was Jewish, so he had to escape uh, Germany, and he came to United States. A lot of major way the American psychology um, world was formed it was because um, all the psychologists escaped from Europe and came to United States. Before that, there were no psychology. There was no psychology school in the United States. It's very interesting. Um, so the major idea we want to understand is what Kurt Lewin, he worked with the study of group dynamics. He started explaining how in a group dynamics, the, the way people think, the way people operate, the way people behave will be completely different. This was a predecessor, okay, before the social psychology field started evolving, right? All the famous social psychologies, uh, experiments that we hear about. My son is actually now studying. He 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 um, chose to his second major to be psychology, and he likes to focus on social psychology. So we have a lot of uh, interesting conversations, right? Where we discuss a lot of social psychology, the famous social psychology research uh, um, uh, theories, all those tests, all those stories, right? 
people read them now, by the way, even if you're not a psychologist, if you don't even have a background, people read them as something very interesting. It's a cool thing to know how social psychology or what type of different social psychology tests people did, right? The major group uh, uh, dynamic uh, test was done when the one I like to tell even my younger kids about, right? When they took about uh, eight or nine people, they put it in the room and they showed a picture of the uh, black square. I believe either a white square, it doesn't matter. That's not the point. The point is they showed a picture of a black square. And the first person, they asked, what color is it? So the person said black. But the rest of the people were not really um, test subjects. They were put in there to see how, they, how influential uh, group dynamics can be. And the rest of the people said, oh, it's a white square. So they went back. All everybody else said it's a white square. They went back again to the first person. And the first person said, oh, actually, I think it is a white square. And that was one of the ways, one of the experiments where they showed that group dynamics matter. People will change their point of view. People will change their mind. People will start thinking differently understanding the world differently. In this case, it was the color. It was obviously black square, but the, the person would say it's white because he will change his opinion based on what the rest of his social setting is, right? This was one of the ways people tested to see how gullible, how changeable, how the people's behavior can change based on social settings, okay? Remember, again, before, uh, Kurt Lewin didn't work with the social settings. His work was called group dynamics. But again, it's the same thing. It's the same, right? He is considered to be as a founder of social psychology, even though back then there was no term coined social psychology. But it's very interesting to start noticing, okay? Um, again, I have a separate video where I talk about it in details. Uh, of course, Carl Gustav Jung, uh, a lot of ideas about symbolism, metaphors, understanding certain words. This is what's very important in the Bogoban coaching program, okay? And the metamodern quadrants. One type is, one understanding is group dynamics. The second understanding, what do words mean to us? Semantics, the meaning of the words, okay? We can take, um, Carl Gustav Jung was the father of analytical therapy, and one of the ways he contributed was the, mental comprehension of how we look at the world, how we can understand the symbols or agree or don't agree, connect or not connect to center symbols of the of the words, right? I like to say this a lot. I did this a lot in the neuro labyrinths course that we did, right? But we work with metaphor because labyrinths, of course, there's a lot of basis in the Greek mythology. Greek mythology, uh, besides it being just a bunch of stories that make not a lot of sense, right? Like where gods uh, fight with each other and uh, try to get somebody to fall in love with them or not, right? Besides that, that the, the major understanding that we all connect to, especially those of us, and when we say all, we talk about the Western world, is the metaphorical understanding of the words, okay? The idea of the Greek mythology is the metaphorical understanding, how we metaphorically per per perceive certain large figures or not such large figures, authoritarians or not, right? Um, I had, uh, well, I still have it in this course also, I have a lady from Dubai who didn't grow up in the Western way of thinking, right? So it's very important to understand that the semantics of the words will matter based on your cultural background. Okay, people who did not grow up in the Western world, the word metaphor will have a completely different meaning. Each word will be different. If I talk about the Greek mythology, people from the like Islamic background, cultural background, will have a completely different understanding. Even people from like Buddhism, right, Oriental uh, way of thinking, which is based upon the Buddhistic approach to life. Um, and by Buddhism, I do mean in generally all, all Oriental-based religions, uh, Zen, um, uh, Confucianism, and all that stuff. I am not an expert in that, just want to let you know. So I, when I say Buddhism, I do mean different uh, direction, different uh, approaches 
with an oriental point of view, oriental religion, oriental philosophy, let's call it, okay? So for them, the Greek mythology or the metaphors within understanding of the Greek mythology, the figures, the uh, words of the Greek mythology will not make sense, will not be relevant. That's an important part to understand. So semantics are very, very important in metamodern quadrants, okay? Understanding of the word, the meaning of the word. Of course, Bert Hellinger. Bert Hellinger is a father of the family constellation and system systemic constellations, uh, uh, a whole new field within uh, the, the field of psychology, right? I like to call it also alignments because what happened is that somehow people don't fully, there is no fully, as much as people try to explain it in mental log logical way, there is no full explanation of how constellations works, how alignments work, but it's very uh, effective. Uh, if you ever been present in a live constellation, that have been present a number of times. I enjoyed it. I saw the effectiveness of this method. Okay, so this is also a background for how Bogoban works. Bogoban is basically a constellations, or I like to call it alignments on the board. That's one of the best way how it's, it is very effective. That's why Bogoban is very effective, just like as uh, live constellations are. Okay, of course, we have uh, the next person who is extremely um, influential in the constellation world. It's uh, uh, Matthias von Kibet, right? I believe he works with his uh, wife. Uh, I haven't gotten to his um, trainings yet. That's something in my bucket list, right? Of all the courses to take, but I heard he's phenomenal. Uh, Rupert is also very famous. He he took the constellation um, explanation from Hellinger and he kind of went into his own way. So people in the constellation field nowadays, they actually ask you, are you the Hellinger type of uh, person or are you the Rupert? So it's very interesting to see that even within the constellation alignments field, there are different directions now. There are different views, different ways to work with the clients. Okay, now we're going to actually go to the metamodern quadrants itself. Okay, the main idea, like I mentioned, is semantics. The way we understand this uh, metamodern quadrants, I'm going to explain later on, will be a square with four sets of words. It either will be one word or sets of words into each of the four squares. The main idea that the way we, we approach the words is something we consider as the word paradigm right? Um, I believe in English it's pronounced paradigm, in Russian it's pronounced as paradigm, right? The letter G is pronounced. So uh, again, you see this is, again, semantics, cultural background. I used to, in the beginning, I would pronounce this as paradigm, and then somebody said, no, in English it's pronounced paradigm. So, so I had to change the way I pronounce it. But again, the cultural background, the cultural influence, where are you coming from, even the language, your native language or your second language, the way you understand different languages, we understand meanings within different cultures will make a difference in this specific um, philosophy, this specific model, okay? So paradigm is the way we view something, okay? The way we look at certain theory, the way we look at a certain methodology, okay? Again, look, the second part of paradigm understanding is linguistic. The way certain words make meaning to us, and it's both subjective, but it can also be somewhat objective if you look at it from your cultural point of view. You will basically look at it as a general understanding of the way your culture or your, uh, yeah, well, let's call it culture, maybe religion, but I think culture will uh, the best reflect everything behind, you know, all of your background, your religious background, your cultural background, your geographical location, right? Where you lived, where you grew up and where you're living now, because people move nowadays, we know people move around different countries much more easier, much more, um, much faster, right? Um, Again, I'm going to go through this fast because I want you to focus. We're going to go back to the to the meta modern quadrants, okay? Because I what I want to do today, we're going to focus on figuring out, looking at two or maybe three, if we have time, two major quadrants that we can utilize. But my again, my point with you in the session is to show you how you can practically use it 
within the Bogoban coaching program, Bogoban coaching system, okay? So the idea of the metamodern quadrant is that there is a square that's broken into four parts, okay? And those four parts represent four paradigms, four different views of the way to see the world, to see a certain philosophy, to understand the words, okay? Again, semantic, both philosophical mental understanding, the paradigms, and semantic, what the words represent to you. We refer them in this course, we will refer them as the four quadrants. You're gonna hear me a lot saying, what quadrant would you like to choose? What does the first quadrant mean? What is the word? What does it mean to you? Okay, so we're gonna look at each quadrant and start understanding what is your subjective um, connection to the quadrant, to the words in the quadrant? And what could be, is there an objective way? If there is, if there is not, sometimes people, and this is how we work in psychology, if it's a trigger word, the word will, your association with that word will only be subjective. I actually went through this um, last week. I had, um, I had a monthly specialist course session and we actually discussed this. Maybe I'm gonna separate that part of the video and also post it here, but that's exactly what we focused on. We had a discussion with one of the uh, participants where she, um, she started telling me that there was a certain word that I said, what does that word mean? And she said that word can only mean one thing because that's a definition of the world. And we started having a discussion that for your client, it doesn't matter what the subjective dictionary uh, definition of the word is. That word can be a trigger for something else. Um, you guys all here are specialists, so you know what I'm talking about when I refer to the algorithm of score. We're drawing the algorithm of score, and we know in the score we go in the past to work, and we do the, the catharsis to work with whatever uh, trigger, trauma, stress, whatever you want to refer to, to that circle in the past. And we started having a discussion and I was explaining that actually the way we understand many things in the world, especially the way your client will come to you to the session will be focusing whichever work, word will trigger them. That will be very important. But a lot of times there will not be an objective connection to the word. Most of the time it will be a very subjective because the word will trigger a certain and we will work with it also. That will also be my focus to use the reflection process with you. It will it will trigger a certain set of emotions, a certain set of thoughts, certain feeling within the body. And of course, we will connect it all to the intuitive understanding of what does this word represent. So it's very, very interesting. Important things to remember whenever we work with quadrants, the important rules, okay? The way the quadrants works is similar to the way the clock works, okay? A lot of times when they do, a lot of times people would start over here, one, two, three, four. That's not the way we work in the metamodern quadrant. Very important, the metamodern quadrant, the first quadrant is always the one, the quadrant, the square that is located on the upper right side. That will be stop, stop number one, quadrant number one. After quadrant number one, we go into quadrant number two, then quadrant number three, and then quadrant number four. Now, interesting rules. Very often, um, it's important to go in sequence. However, however, there will be algorithms that we will probably be exploring in the second module where quadrant number, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the sequence can be somewhat changed. We can go in quadrant number four and then go into three, go into two, two, and then one. In the beginning though, we will be exploring the Bogoban algorithms in the way where we go in the right sequence, meaning one, two, three, four. Now the rule in metamodern quadrants, okay? And I have heard different ways of explaining. One of the latest way of explaining is the way Pavel explains is that it is very rarely that you can go from quadrant number one into quadrant number four. You can easily go from one to two and maybe from two to one. Not so easy to go backward, but it's possible. You can go one, two, three, and then from two travel, three travel back to two. You can go to four and then travel back to three or to two, but it is 
the the way I heard the explanation is that it's almost impossible to travel back from one into four. And the explanation used to the semantic, again, the quadrant, the meaningful, the meanings associated with this explanation was that we're using the growth, uh, the perinatal matrices of Stanislav growth, where the number one, I actually have it here, give me a second. Let me find you that, that quadrant, because that was the best way to explain why it works that way. No, wait, give me a second. I have it somewhere else. I'm actually doing studies of growth perinatal mattresses in a different, um, in my per reparenting course. So I have this presentation here ready. Okay. According to Stanislav Grof, perinatal mattresses, okay? Um, quadrant number, at least the way we're using it in the metamodern quadrants philosophy, okay? The way we're going to approach it in this course. Perinatal mattresses, perinatal, the first quadrant is always the nine month of pregnancy, the way the fetus develops in the womb. The second part will be separation and the beginning of the birth. The third part is passing through the birth canal, the actual birth process of coming out. And once a baby coming out, it's called adaptation, what we refer to the rest of the life. Now, it's very interesting to understand if we look at it the way we just uh, approached this idea that you cannot go from one to four is, is explained like this. You cannot be kind of unborn, okay? You can regress. And again, it's just like everything else in philosophy, it's quite what? Arguable. You can actually have hours and hours of discussion in arguing with me, and we can have arguments for hours. I will say you cannot, you can say you can, and even vice versa. I can explain to you how we can. Because the idea is that over here in adaptation where we are now in the rest of the life, none of us is in the womb, we can have something called what? Regression, right? One of the ideas that actually Stanislav Grof used quite heavily when he created the holotropic breath work, breath work, right? And that's the idea that in adaptation, you can regress back as you passing through the birth canal, as you're passing through the start of birth, and as you pa as you are living your life in the womb, right? In the reparenting part that I'm leading now, that's actually what we're doing, okay? We just went through the part where we lived in the perinatal, and we stopped, you know, we're working through the separation and the start of birth. That's where I prepared this um, specific presentation. But it's interesting to note that nowadays, the regression we do, and not only nowadays, it's been done for the last 20, 30 years. Um, forgot his name. I have his book, Michael Newton. Yeah, Michael Newton. Called The book is called The Journey of the Soul. But he actually talks and he, he he's a, a very uh, qualified and experienced psycho psychologist, maybe even a psychiatrist, who had sessions with, with clients where they regressed back to before the perinatal work, to the journeys of the soul, to what was the previous life uh, journey of that specific soul. So, so we can argue back and forth, okay? Um, again, this was like, I think about maybe a year or two that I heard that you cannot go back from one to four. But if you look at this specific, um, even um, what do you call that? Uh, presentation, right? This picture that I got from the Institute, it's interesting to note that it even shows here that from one, you can go to four, but it's very, very hard. And it's like passing through the different world. That's exactly what it is. Regressing to see the soul journey is not very easy. Not every um, psychiatrist or psychologist or hypno hypnotizer, right, can do it, right? Hypnosis specialist can do. So that's something to keep in mind. It is much easier to go from quadrants from four to three, from three to two, and from two to one. But to go from one to four takes a lot, a lot of what? What is the word we use in the coaching world? Resources. It would take a lot of resources. Um, Sabina, what what was uh, the way you learned in the Germany school? Can you go back from one to four or not? I'm interested at this point. I would love to hear your uh, your point of view on this because I know you learned this in a Germany school. But basically, this is what it is. Now, it's interesting. 
Look at the arrows that are going diagonally. When you are in the first quadrant, it's very often that you will feel very much connected to the third quadrant. And it's understandable because it seems like the third quadrant is right nearby. All you have to do is to cross the quadrants diagonally. However, it's very important to understand that we must go through all the quadrants. We must go through all the steps, just like I showed you um, in the growth perinatal mattresses. A, a child, right? Let's talk about it, right? If somebody asked me, I was explaining this, right? How can a child go from perinatal to pathing through the birth canal without the separation, without the start, the beginning of the birth? It's impossible. There must be some kind of uh, process where the birth has started, right? Uh, those of you who had a baby or not, or, but you more or less understand. The idea is that the start of the birth either starts with the contractions or with the breakage of the water, right? The water break, right? One of this, you can't have it, except when. Think about it, except when, when it comes to birth, except when it comes to C-section. What happens in C-section? In C-section, the baby goes from being in perinatal in the womb. And even then there is some kind of separation. It's just not happening on the behalf of the baby consciously or even subconsciously. The baby doesn't go through the start of the birth. The baby doesn't go through the separation process and the baby doesn't go through the passing of the birth canal, but rather the baby goes from first to the fourth more or less seamlessly without any physical exertion, without any physical um, kind of uh, trying on the baby, right? This, and a lot of time people who are, um, who are perinatal experts, there are experts in perinatal in this mattress, right? In this quadrant, they actually say that children, when they don't go through these two processes, are different are children who have a hard time dealing with challenges in life psychologically, right? So it's interesting to note that yes, it is possible. And that's why we looked at this quadrant as yes, you can in a way go from one to four, right? But not backwards, but rather like kind of omitting two and three. But it's the best psychologically more, um, kind of recommended and better for a person's development and understanding of the way the world works is to go to one, then to two, then to three, and then to four. Make sure, and that will be an important rule when we're gonna work with the board, make sure you will put tokens in all quadrants. Don't miss any quadrant because each quadrant will contribute to you reaching your goal. Well, let me see, Sabine wrote something. Ah, yeah, maybe that's what it was. Yes, yes, you're right. That was the new explanation. Absolutely. Thank you, Sabine, for that. Yes, exactly. Sabine explained it to me. That's right. That's what, that was a new addition that they added like a year ago. And I listened again to the explanation of the quadrant. They said you can go from one to four. It's from two to one, you can never go. Why? Because you can never go back into the utero. You can never go back into the womb. Thank you. See, I knew I should I ask you. I was like, something was telling me, ask Sabine, because I knew there was some kind of information. Absolutely correct. That's exactly the correct explanation. You can never go back to the womb. Whether a child is born through the C-section or a natural birth, it doesn't matter. There is no going back into the womb, right? A person, once the person is born, it's absolutely right. Thank you for that, Sabine. Excellent. So that's what it is, okay? Important to understand that from two to one, it's interesting, but in the board though, when we're gonna work with the board, we're gonna see how that works. We're gonna see different algorithm and see how we can utilize or not utilize. But it's interesting when it comes to growth perinatal mattresses, it's important to understand that child can never go back into the womb. Once the water breaks, once the second uh, stage started, that's it. The birth will inevitably happen. And uh, all the good OBGYNs know it, right? That's why they say, once the water breaks, once the contraction, a regular contraction start, once the birth process started, the baby must come out. That's why they deal very seriously. If there is any issue with the birth, that's when they do C-section. Excellent. 
Okay, let's go further into understanding the way metamodern quadrants work so we can start working with the board. Um, all ideas can be broken into four parts, thus forming a quadrant, okay? We're gonna look at two major ones. This is the one we're gonna consider now, okay? Seasons, okay? We can actually work with this practically, okay? The way the seasons are broken are connected to not the way we start the year, which always starts in the winter, not in the Western world, but rather in the Oriental, in the Chinese medicine world, in the Feng Shui world, okay? Over there, think about Chinese New Year. It was just happened a month ago, right? The year starts in spring, then comes the summer, then comes the fall, and then comes the winter. And just like the same, if I ask you philosophically or logically, subjectively, objectively, can you have spring and then fall? Every single one of you will say no. Because objectively, cultural, no matter what culture, by the way, you, you, you grow up in, right? Whatever the background religion you have, whatever culture, whatever country, whatever geographical location you grow up, these four seasons are based on what? Are based on the nature cycles. This is how nature works. We always have spring. We always have after the spring comes the summer. After the summer always comes fall. After the fall always comes winter. I live in Florida in the USA. So officially I don't have... My kids complain that there is no snow. I like it. I'm okay. I don't like the coldness. But my kids complain. So even though there is no snow, if you ask me, do I still have winter? Yes. Whether I want it or not, still the months of December, January, and February, when we go through those months, it's called winter. So this is interesting to understand. So that each quadrant can be approached from, like what I said, logical, mental, objective way. Um, uh, and it can also be a, approached psychologically. Now, what if I ask you psychologically now, and this will be, of course, subjectively, I will ask you, what do you feel like? Now, how do you feel like? And that's actually what we're going to do practically now, okay? We're going to work and understand how we feel. Psychologically, sometimes I feel like a spring, Spring represents renewal. Spring represents something new, the, the nature awakening, right? From winter sleep, from the winter hibernation, right? So even though now is March, sometimes I still feel like winter, like I want to sleep a lot. I feel like I'm not so productive. I don't have as much energy. And that represents psychologically winter. You're going to say, Lana, it's March now. Officially, March is spring. Do you understand? So there are different ways we can approach each quadrant. We can always look at it very logically, very mentally and say, you know what? It's March now, it's spring. I can only look at it as spring, but we can also understand and that's why we will be using a lot the reflection process. It's very important for us to utilize the reflection process. Why? For this specific reason. So we don't get too hang up on the mental logical, metaphorical explanation and um, consideration, understanding of the word. So do you guys understand? This is a very interesting algorithm we're gonna have because at one point we will deal with, we will choose a quadrant as we start working with the Bogoban coaching program. And we will at first approach it on a mental level. I will ask you, what does it mean? And there is no much explanation necessary it just represents seasons, natural cycle, the way the nature psychically changes around you in nature. The weather changes, right? The nature around us changes. The trees outside of my window changes, right? Again, not so much because I'm in Florida, right? So I do have greens, but even still, um, I can let more, more. No, I still have trees where there are no leaves. Not as much as, let's say, it would happen in New York, but still, okay? It does change, but it's the, but then we will approach it from the reflection process. We will make sure to make it personalized, to make it subjective, to understand how do I see it? Do I feel like winter? Do I feel like spring? You know what? I may feel like summer or I may feel like fall. Okay, and we will approach, we will start understanding, okay, again, Objective ways of understanding the seasons is 
A, connecting to the nature, what's happening around you in the nature. In the spring, the nature awakes, it's a renewal. The grass, the growing of the green grass, right? The, the trees start gaining their green leaves again, right? The trees kind of awake and start producing leaves, start getting prepared to produce what? Fruits. Then we have the summer. The summer represents fruits. The summer represents gathering fruits, having fruits uh, ripened, gathering ripened fruits, enjoying the fruits, right? If we talk about metaphor, that represents what? Resources, right? We're gathering resources. Remember the neuro tree, uh, metaphorical understanding, when we draw the circles on top, that represents fruits. When we gather the fruits, when we draw um, baskets or vessels that collect the fruits for you to be utilizing it towards your goal, that all represents the summer. And think about it, what is summer? Summer is warm, summer is a lot of sun, right? Sun represents a, a huge hub of resources, right? We have a specific, within our body, if we're connected to our body, think about the chakra representation. We have a chakra that's actually called the solar perplex. It connects us to the yellow color. It connects it to the sun being the hub of resources. So that's, again, an explanation, objective explanation. But each one of us, of course, we have our own association, our own understanding of what the summer or the spring represents. Now let's go to the fall. What does fall represent? Fall represents what usually happens in the fall in mostly all of the cultures, all of the countries. Children start school in the fall. Okay, so it's considered to be the time where in the children's level, right? Adults, not for adults. Adults can have college starts every semester, but for children, school always starts in, this, in the fall. Why is that? Start thinking, start understanding. What does it tell you about yourself? Why do you think so? Mentally, logically, but also philosophically. Also understanding how does it happen? Remember, children started going to school for the past like 100, maybe a maximum 150 years. Hundred for the past hundred years is when school became an institutionalized requirement. Almost all countries have it as a requirement for children to attend school. I homeschooled my kids for many years, so I know the, how it works. In order to homeschool your school, you can't just take your school out of school. You have to apply to the Department of Education and write down, I would like to homeschool my kids. This will be the program of study. They will have to approve it. It's institutionalized. And it's interesting to start note, every single country starts school in the fall. Why? Think about it, why? That's something to understand on a subjective level. Is there a subjective level? Because I'm sure there is an objective level of understanding this, okay? What else does the fall represent? Thinking about nature. Fall represents what? When after the summer, right? By the way, notice, even though we collect many fruits in the summer, those represent what kind of fruits? Remember we mentioned the neuro tree, the fruits that grow on top. So they're actually what? Fruits. If we talk about agricultural terms, again, semantics makes a difference. If we're talking about vegetables, which are resources that grow where? On the bottom, on the, in the harvest. Absolutely, it's a harvest season, exactly. It's a, vegetables do not grow on the tree. Vegetables grow where? They grow down on earth. They're about what? They're about, to, if we understand metaphysical understanding of vegetables are what? Grounded, right? Think about the word in English, it's called um, staple food. Staple food represents food that grow within the soil. Potatoes, um, I, and there I watch my carbs, so it's all the carb foods, right? Potatoes, carrots, um, uh, beets, uh, what do you call that, um, turnips, right? When we think about about more than 100 years ago, 100, yeah, I would say up until 100 years ago, people would only eat staple food. People would only eat vegetables. Most of the time, remember, the riches were not so many. Very, The riches were like maybe 10 to 15% of the human population. If we're talking about, again, uh, general um, Western countries, maybe, let's say, okay? Before what we came to now where government rules when we had the monarchy, right? And we had the 
riches, right? We still have the richest system, but it's a bit different, more or less. People have more or less more opportunities to become rich. Before, 100 years ago below, think about it. You cannot just become rich. You would have to be born into a royalty system, into a rich system. People who would become rich, right? They were looked upon. They were like, you know, they weren't born rich. They became rich and they were like not accepted in the high society. So think about the food that people ate. Poor people, people who are peasants, what did they eat? They only ate staple food. It was a what about, and it's understanding philosophically. They were very grounded. They didn't study. They didn't have a high education. They didn't, their knowledge was not as eclectic or as, um, yeah, as eclectic or as, as, um, as much as the people who were born where they could get what? Remember, there were no institutionalized education. People would hire tutors who would come and teach their children. So again, you have to be able to afford it. No, but not everybody could do it. Up until like, I would say, yeah, like 100 years ago, maybe 150. Um, in some areas of the world, it was 150. I think in the US, but it still wasn't uh, a requirement for children to, to attend schools. But I know in the US, if you read even Little Women, which was, I think, based in the, the end of 1800s. Yeah. They talks about how the girls went to school. So there was some kind of a system, but it wasn't a requirement. The requirement became for children to move, that they must attend school like about a hundred years ago. So that's something interesting to know. Fall is about harvest. Fall is about working with the field, grounding, getting down. What is summer? Summer, you just, you, that's why a lot of people take vacations in the summer. You vacation, you enjoy the weather, you enjoy the sun. You go to the beach a lot, right? Remember when I used to live in New York, going to the beach was like, a must do every Sunday. Why? Because there's only like two months to enjoy the beach. And I love water. Okay. I love the beach. I love swimming. I love everything with water. Water is my resource element. So I love water. So it's interesting to note people in New York go to the beach every Sunday. It was uh, every weekend, right? It was a thing. People go to the beach because that's the only way to, to enjoy that area of the nature. That's something to understand. So in the summer, people are not, and everybody, I, even I know, like I, I don't sell a lot of courses in the summer because people don't go. People have vacation. People don't want to study. People don't take courses, okay? And that's the idea. In the summer, people are what? They're high up. They're fantasizing. They're imagining. They're enjoying themselves. They're not grounded. Fall comes, autumn, right? In English, it's also called autumn, but it's interesting. In America, I think autumn is more like a British word, right? In Europe, they use the word autumn. In America, they use the, the word fall. It, had, it took me some time to transfer. Why? Why fall? Because what happens in the nature in the fall, in the autumn? Leaves fall out. Leaves are falling out from the trees. Another metaphorical view of looking at it. Falling down, even the leaves that are growing high up. Remember from the neuro tree what that represents. High up is being in the cloud, connecting to the high up, to the transcendental, to the divine, right? Even the leaves are saying, no, it's time to ground. And they fall to the ground. They change colors, colors change, right? Um, again, if you are in the area of the, world, of the world where, in Florida, I don't see that so much, but in New York, I remember we would travel and we would actually see how the trees are changing color, right? The leaves are changing color. They become beautiful orange, dark, light red, dark red, brown, purple. Wow, the beauty of colors, fall colors. Okay, that's interesting to note. That's what it is. Fall is about ground. I didn't even bring here the explanation of the element. What does fall represent? Fall represent the element of the earth, talking about grounding and metal. Grounding, heaviness. Metal is about being a bit heavy, being, you know, it's not so easy to change metal elements. Metal people are not so easy. Once they they have, they have focus on something, they will focus on that thing. It's very hard for them to just move. They're not as fluid, right? It's a very trendy word nowadays to say fluid, right? That's how 
uh, current generation think, their way of thinking is very fluid. It's very easy because what? Current generation is more what? The water element, which is the last, the winter. And that's an interesting part. After the fall, fall is also preparing for hibernation, which is what winter represents, sleeping, resting, connection. Remember that the, um, the lifespan connection to this word would be what? The first one is a child. The second one is a teenager. The third one is adult, right? Grounding is adult. And the fourth one is what? It used to be called elderly. That's not what we call it now. It's about wisdom. It's a preparation to change your status, to change the way you live now. In the winter, people hibernate. In the winter, people tend to figure out, right? More what's happening. People don't have as much of energy to move around, right? In the winter, usually what do employers do? They create different um uh what do you call that workshops to get their employees what kind of put the fire under them because people in the winter are very mellow because this is the season to rest right i always like to say i probably was a bear in the previous life because i like to hibernate i like to sleep in the winter but research has shown every a lot of most people have liked to sleep in the winter that's what it is Okay, so that's an interesting part to view. Um, what else did I want to say? Something about the winter. I want to say something came in my mind. I didn't say it. And now I'm... something I wanted to mention. Um, but, oh, yeah, that's what happens. What happens in the winter? We have the holidays of light. Every culture has a holiday of lights. It's about lights because what happens in the winter, it's also dark. What does darkness represent? The same thing. Darkness represents right before light, right before it gets lighted, the, the, the sun comes up, represents the darkness, the nighttime. What do we do in the nighttime? We sleep, we rest, right? Except those of you who is like me, an owl, you're gonna say, I don't like to sleep at night. I like to sleep in the morning, right? Some people are owls and that's what also printer represents. Remember in the neurographic, it's a neural line. Right? The neural line is sometimes goes to the right, sometimes goes to the bottom, right? Sometimes takes you to the horizontal setting, sometimes takes you over here in the summer, and sometimes takes you to the fall. But winter is basically, um, yeah, a lot of times it's interesting. Uh, there were a lot of discussions at one point that why do the kids start their school in fall? It should be the opposite. They should start school in the spring summer fall and in the winter they should rest but that's again up for discussion right and that's what it is right i just gave you a very uh i tried to give you a subjective understanding of this quadrant but i'm sure you would have if we could we could have philosophically discussed it for hours and hours okay let me see. And the second quadrant that we're going to explore today would be the cardinal points or geographical locations or the compass points, okay? Before we start working practically with the board, which we're gonna do in the next section. This I'm not gonna explain as much because honestly, I'm not so much, as much as I love geography, uh, this is explanation is very, as objective as it gets at this point at least. And this, you start using it on the board. The explanation is there is east, there is south, there is west, and there is north, okay? East represents, um, and the connection of the cardinal points over here, by the way, is connecting to the seasons. The way we explain the seasons according to the uh, Chinese medicine, according to the way, um, yeah, I guess, according to, to most cultures also view the beginning of the world like that, by the way. Right, East represents the spring. Now, it's interesting to note, the more you're going to learn about the quadrant, the more you're going to notice how they refer to each other. And a lot of times when I at least use the Bogoban, but again, remember, I'm more practiced. I've been using Bogoban for the past three years, I would say already. Um, it's about, yeah, it's about being able to seamlessly use, even though you're supposed to use one 
quadrant for every session. And we, again, we're gonna learn how to do that in the next section as we start doing it practically. But it's interesting to know that sometimes a very good um, coach will be able to connect quadrants within one quadrant with another quadrant. And clients, the more they're gonna start using the Bogoban coaching system, they will also start noticing how they connect to different quadrants, okay, within your mind. Because remember where it's about again? It's about metaphors, it's about logical, it's about symbolism, semantics. How do you, associations, how does this word relate to you? So spring, of course, is completely related to the east, right? Because south, where it's very, very hot, would coincide with the summer, right? West coincides with the fall, and north, where it's very, very cold, coincides with the winter. Okay, something interesting to kind of, a lot of time, like one of the major, major um, reviews from this course in the Russian Institute, because I'm, you know, I, I have access, it's actually open with me now as I was preparing for the session today. Most people was like, this is a breaking, like, they're like, it's the big bang, the new big bang theory. You know, the way you mind, the way you approach, the way you view things is like, boom. It's like the new big bang theory, the new, um, what do you call that? Um, uh, what we like to call the fireworks, right? To dish, you know, like a new way of seeing the way we understand the world, the way we view certain words, you will be more careful from now on to even pay attention to the way certain words have different associations for you, okay? This will actually, those of you who took the, the pyramid of development, similar idea. The understanding of the words is very important. I will be introducing it in the fall, the pyramid, right? Um, and the truth is the right way, I was thinking very carefully, should I do the pyramid first and then Bogoban? Because that would be the right way, because pyramid, guess what? Belongs in the second quadrant, the program, and the Bogoban belongs here. And um, I don't know why, but intuitively I'm connected more to the Bogoban. So I decided to do the Bogoban first, but uh, the pyramid will be done in the fall and it will... They will, you will see how they all connect to each other. Neurographica belongs in the first quadrant. Pyramid belongs here, Bogoban here. And of course, the neuro labyrinth, the labyrinth understanding the philosophy, the understanding, the way to use it in the coaching sessions belongs in the fourth quadrant. Um, what else? And you know what? I'm going to do this, even though I'm supposed to, I want us to focus on two quadrants at a time. I don't want to give you too many quadrants because it's going to kind of mess with your association. But I'm going to use this one because this is an oldie, goodie oldie, right? I mean, we've been using it. I use it in every neurographic session, literally. Every time, all my basics courses, even specialists, I always use it, okay? We know the first quadrant, the development, the human lifespan, right? Stages of development. First stage is the way the baby, the child development is. Rapid physical growth. Right, and that's what we see in the spring. Rapid physical growth, leaves appear, you see buds, right? Those of you who uh, who like to go see the, um, what do you call that, the, um, the Japanese um, tree. Um, oh my God, it's in my mind and I can't bring it out. I remember when we used to live in Brooklyn, I would go to the botanical garden, I believe April or May, would be the time, you know who I, what I'm talking about, the beautiful pink buds, right? Um, sakura, the sakura, yeah, cherry blossoms, it's called sakura, absolutely, yes. Cherry blossoms, it's called sakura. You go to see sakura because you can see, right? And also what does spring represent? A variety, not a, more variety of colors will also be in the summer, but spring represents the beginning of the color because remember what winter represents, kind of, Bluish, but blue can have many hues, right? Uh, the idea of 50 shades of gray, right? The, the, what was so uh, phenomenal about the name that uh, I forgot her name, the author of 50 Shades of Gray's book brought up, that gray, many people consider it to be like so blah, but she says gray can have up to 50 shades. And winter is the same thing, right? To us, winter, it seems like 
it's all about what? Like a little bit blah, even weather-wise blah, right? It's like, oh, it's constantly snowing. It's constantly, the best part is the snow. But then a day later, what happens to the snow? It turns into this really disgusting looking gray ice. And that's very slippery and it's very dangerous and people don't like it, right? And that's a whole, like, the whole idea is like, oh, in the winter, people get tired. They're like, when does spring come already? People can't wait. Comes March, even April. It was like, when will the spring come already, right? And then spring comes and that's what it brings us, awakening, not just nature, but also waking of color. And that's why people like to go see sakura, right? Because they start looking and we know that it's very important. That's what neurographica represents, right? That spring, remember neurographic associations here, spring, representation of art. Why do people like to go to the museums to view art? Because it connects them to the soul awakening. What happens in the spring, it's awakening of the soul. It's a beginning of understanding how do we view what will this year be for me how will my life what turn am i taking this year right many people make new year resolution here in the winter right but the truth is the true beginning starts here in the spring okay when you truly wake up and we truly start seeing the implementation of the resolutions in the spring and then of course summer comes and it's about teens it's about emotions Teens represent summer because it's high emotions. What happens with teens? High emotions represent high heat. What's in the summer? High heat. High, high heat. Everybody turn on their air conditioners, right? I have my air conditioner on the whole year here in Florida. I had it on last night, even though it's a bit cold outside today. But um, I still have sometimes the air conditioner on because I need uh, some, some coldness, right? That's what it is. Constant heat. Constant, you know inability this this what does teen represent hormones right high amount of hormones being released and they need to learn to what they need to learn how to contain their emotions right how to handle how to figure out which when do we let our emotions express ourselves but when do i learn to suppress it a bit right and the important thing is to learn to still and we're going to do that in the reflection process to still accept whatever emotion you have it, but direct it. That's something most of us never learned, right? I'm planning to do a whole course called the emotions where we focus on accepting negative emotions, which most of us never learned how to do that as a child because our parents never knew how to do that, right? But the idea is to learn to accept your emotions and use it as a resource, use it to direct it toward course reaching your goal which will always be in quadrant number four after teens come adults adults represent the fall grounding what do i need to do right remember harvest season is about what storing necessary food for the winter where there will be the earth is sleeping agriculturally speaking there will be no food in the winter so Whatever you work, right? Whatever you do in this fall, however much you collect in the fall is what you're going to have to eat in the winter, right? And then, of course, winter comes, which represents elderly passing to the next stage, okay? Going renewal, starting again, a new, okay? Hey, guys, give me a second. Somebody's calling me. My daughter's teacher it might be something important.
my apologies. Um, again, there's a school call, so I tend to pick up. <clears throat> and that's an interesting part, to learn to start understanding, to learn to start seeing associations. Again, they may be different than the way I explained it to you, and that's fine. That's absolutely great. That should be like that. When I give you an objective point of view for each of the quadrants, again, you have to keep in mind, that's my cultural background. That's the way maybe I heard the explanation when I was growing up, or I heard the explanation, let's say in this case, could be from Pavel, which explained things in his own level, the way he understands it, right? You're coming from a different background, different geographical location, different nationality, different culture, different religion, so on and so forth. You will have your own understanding of each of these words. And this is, will be the interesting journey. You will start discovering this beautiful, new, deep understanding of the world in a completely new way as you start your relationship with the metamodern quadrants, with the words, with the explanation, with the philosophy. Okay? Um, yeah, you know what? We're not going to use it now. We're going to keep it for the next session. Um, that's about it. Okay, we've been on for like about an hour. Um, those of you watching in an open uh, recording, welcome to join the Bogoban coaching program. It's an amazing comprehensive program that I'm inviting you to join. Simple yet extremely effective way to figure out how to bring your goal into the reality. Okay, welcome to join. Welcome to join my website, neurographicausa.com, for details and to register.